Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Thank you for having us, yeah. Um, how did you guys get into science fiction, horror, and comic books? Um, like, I think that's always kind of where we have to start. Like, what, what was your origin story with, with genre and comics? Sorry, with Damien. Start, Damien yeah. Okay. Um, right. I like how you, it was like you pointed and it came right into my Zoom box there. That was good. Um, <laughs> Well, comics I started uh, when I was about six with uh, Spider-Man. It was a Marvel Tales that reprinted the uh, Death of Gwen Stacy storyline. Uh, and I mean, that, that was kind of heavy for a six-year-old probably, but I was more identified with uh, Peter Parker was sick in the story, like he had a cold. And my dad had bought me the comic because I had a cold. So I read a panel where Peter Parker was coughing, like, right while I was coughing. It was like, oh, my God, I'm Spider-Man. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like, after that, I'm trying to think, like, like uh, I think both my mom and my dad definitely influenced my interest in just, like, science fiction more generally. Because uh, they both, I remember watching the original Star Trek when I was really young and, like, the 60s Batman. Uh, so they all always kind of encouraged interest in genre fiction science fiction um and then uh in terms of actually like writing it and doing it uh pretty soon after i read that spider-man comic i started drawing my own spider-man comics uh possibly because i didn't realize you could just buy more <laughs> but you know it, it worked for me um and then um yeah those that's sort of the origin story for it. And then I've, I've just been a huge film fan like all my life. I uh, used to see movies back when you could go see movies, you know, like at least once a week. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's my origin story. I also had a huge Stephen King addiction around eighth grade or so that I think that's played when a I started. big part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, maybe that's just the right age. I don't know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've just, I, I think I've always been drawn to like science fiction, fantasy stuff. Well, and the cool thing about discovering Stephen King when that age is that when you reread the books as an adult, you get a different experience. So you get to kind of experience for the first time twice. Um, John, yeah. uh, how did you get into uh, genre and comics and that kind of thing? Oh, that's easy. Um, you can blame my mom for that. <laughs> I'll, she's she's getting like she she's the one that introduced me to like my first comics. Um, my mom was a a literature uh, major at Alcorn State University, so she had a lot of books laying around. I grew up um, in Mississippi, like off in the cut, like in the uh, in a very rural space. So there wasn't a lot to get into except for like you know some thickets and collecting bugs and looking at the stars and you know that kind of stuff. Like seriously, it was very Steinbeckian, but you know, but it's more but more poor, you know, saying, you know, black and poor and Steinbeckian, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so, um, but, but yeah, but she had plenty of books laying around and stuff. And I was, I started reading like super early. Um, I think some of the first stuff I read was like, you know, um, Edgar Allan Poe's work and mythology and stuff. I started reading around that stuff super early and just was attracted to it. I was also really into images, just all kinds of images, you know, uh, early too. But um, basically my mom, she gave me like my first, comics and like Thor and like, um, uh, you know, Spider-Man, like Damien and also Daredevil and stuff like that. So I just fell in love with those really early. And I just kind of made the connection between like the Norse mythology stuff that I was reading and also like, you know, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee's Thor, you know, it was pretty cool. And then um, my grandmother actually was also like a teller of tall tales. Like she was really into like talking about haints and ghost stories and, and superstitions and, you know, stuff like, and, like kind of folkloric you know, horror to a certain degree, you know? And um, these days, like, I think I realized that she probably was like into hoodoo and conjure culture. Like, I think she was a root worker for it's become, because of the, some, some of the stuff that she would say. So I'm coming up in this kind of like Southern Gothic, you know, post civil rights era, Mississippi. 
with like a mom who's really into like action movies and horror. We would watch stuff all the time, you know, like all kinds of horror movies. Um, and uh, I was watching like a lot of inappropriate <laughs> exploitation film probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we have really great conversations about it, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, she's still like really big into like horror and action, like even to this day, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of like where I was, you know, I kind of fell in love with that stuff. I mean, I had like an, a subscription to like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Ma Alfred Hitchcock Magazine. And you know, like Twilight Zone used to have a magazine back in the day. Remember that? Yeah, I loved Twilight yeah, Zone. So magazine. I used to have that. Yeah. That was the first time I read The Raft. By Stephen King was in Twilight Zone magazine and it just totally messed me up. And I was oh, like, "This man. is great!" And I think I never want to read anything like this again. I, I must have more. <laughs> I so actually, yeah, that's kind of like where. My, yeah, the raft yeah. is one of my all-time favorite stories, and I actually taught a great, class. Great short story. Yeah, I we taught a class at a horror film fest here on writing horror, and we used the raft as a, mm -hmm. an example of building suspense. So the raft is very close to my heart too. <laughs> Now, John, yeah, I'm it's, interested, it's, though, because, and I love hearing stories of parents who who get mm -hmm. their kids into things. Um, were there particular authors that that your mother was into that really wanted, that, that she got you into? And when did you start bringing authors to her? You know, that's a good question. I, you know, um, she had a lot of, you know, traditional literature stuff, but she's she was a big Stephen King reader. And like, Ellery Queen, like she, she, she read like a lot of mysteries. So she actually had like um, subscriptions to stuff like Ellery Queen magazine. And she, she was really big in Ag Agatha Christie. She read a lot more mystery than horror, but Stephen King and like Clive Barker actually too were like early things that were in the house, you know. Um, and um, a lot of classic literature though, cause I read, I read like a lot of Poe. And then also, um, you know, I read a lot of, uh, your younger mystery stuff like I was really big into like Encyclopedia Brown and stuff like that you know at an early age and then um you know Bullfinch's mythology so it's like more classic stuff you know um mm -hmm. I don't know when I started bringing stuff to her it was probably more comics honestly you know but here's the thing like my mom's a really big film like she would watch a lot of film I don't know if it's necessarily authors but more like directors and like movies you know my, my mom would only choose movies that sounded cool like she yeah. chose <laughs> like <laughs> like sources you know anything with the word ninja in it? She was gonna she was gonna watch that. You know, I took it took me it took me forever to actually get her to, to watch the Shawshank Redemption, for instance. Even though it's a Stephen King based on Stephen King's story, she didn't know what it meant. She was like, "That sounds stupid. I don't know what that even is about." Now it's one of her favorite movies. <laughs> She's like, you know, no. So it's more film, I think, uh, actually, because we were, you know, this is the heyday of like v VHS rentals and you know. Um, yeah. So we would be watching, we would go to like the, the Blockbuster or whatever family value video store and just stock up on, you know, a bunch of movies and just watch, we just binge, we were binge watching before we knew what it was, you know what I'm saying? So we're like binge watching the, the whole like, you know, doll, doll Man series or like all the horrible, beautiful stuff from like Full Moon, you know? I mean, it was like, yeah. see, we can't see anymore. It's like, it's like my eyes are so tired. And then we just start up, we take like a power nap and yeah, because when I would go home from college, for instance, I would, we would do that all the time. <laughs> we would just, for Thanksgiving or whatever, we'd just be watching movies like the whole time. So anyway, I'm sorry. It just, I just, it just, I just reminded, it just reminded me that, oh, did that so I was. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And I think it informs a little bit about, you know, who you are <laughs> as, as a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so Damien, um, who are your first, uh, well, you said Stephen King, but, um, were there other authors that, that you got into before? We'll talk about Octavia Butler next, but are there any sure. other formative authors that were really big for you? Yeah. Um, well, I was always a big fan. Uh, like, well, uh, John mentioning Encyclopedia Brown, I was always big into like Hardy Boys. Oh, the Hardy Boys. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, what was the other one? Three Investigators with the kids who would like meet Alfred Hitchcock and like yeah. he'd send them on mysteries and stuff. I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, but let's see, like uh, another kind of formative writer was Harlan Ellison uh, in my like early teens. Um, I sort of was introduced to his work through, I really liked Frank Miller because mm -hmm. uh, I'd read Dark Knight Returns when I was young. And then Sin City uh, soon after that, also probably hugely inappropriate. And um, 
uh, Frank Miller had done a cover for a Ellison book. Um, what is it? Something Onyx, like cast in Onyx. Anyway, um, but that, that was how I uh, first started reading Harlan Ellison stuff. Um, and I happened to be in around San Francisco at the time. My mom and I were visiting her friends who lived nearby. And uh, we went to the bookstore where I got that book. Harlan Ellison had written a story uh, like in their front window. He would just like get it, have somebody feed him an idea and he would just type up a story in bookstores front windows. Uh, so they had copies of that there. So I, that was so cool to me to have like, you know, something fresh off the author's typewriter to read. I think that had a big influence on me as well. Um, and then I'm trying to think who else. James Baldwin, I started reading kind of early on. Uh, not super early, probably that was closer, like late teens, early 20s. Um, but I also felt like his fiction had a big impact on me. Like, um, oh, Sonny's, sorry, I can't think of words today. <laughs> but uh, his, his short story uh, about the jazz musician and his brother, mm. Sonny's dream, Sonny's, Ah, anyway, it's good. <laughs> the internet exists. It's good. Yeah. Um, was it was it Mephisto and Onyx? I just yeah, that was the Ellison one. Yeah, Mephisto and Onyx. Thank you. Not um, a, I had no, I had never heard it before, but you know the Googles. Yeah, yeah the Googles. <laughs> yeah, it, it has like it has like cool uh, Sin City style Frank Miller cover. Yeah. Uh, before Frank Miller went totally off the deep end, but um. Yeah, so I think those had a lot of impact. And then in comics, Alan Moore, I uh, discovered pretty early on. Um, I think because like I was collecting and reading image comics because I was at the right age for that. Um, you know, I was like 13 or something. And uh, Alan Moore started writing uh, Wildcats. And I remember reading that and be like, oh, wait, this is good. Like, this is different <laughs> from those other ones. I mean, those are fun, but this is good. Right. Um, <laughs> So after that, I, I sought out more of his work. Uh, so he had a big influence just on my thinking about comics as a, an art form and what we can do uh, with it. And then also uh, Scott McCloud. Uh, I remember a comic shop owner at uh, Moon Dogs Comics in like, I think it was Orland Park, mm -hmm. Orland Square, um, handed me like the an original copy uh, like it, it was right after it first come out, handed me a copy of Understanding Comics. Uh, so reading that early on had a big influence as well. Mm. Well, you know, Harlan Ellison plays a huge role in, in Octavia Butler's situation too, because she was he was one of her instructors at, uh, at Clarion. And, um, mm -hmm. and also, uh, you know, as much as he had that grading personality, <laughs> he championed Octavia uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, so let's talk about Octavia Butler. And I, I, I want, let's get going on her because for me, um, I, I admit my situation with reading her work, I started reading Octavia Butler around 2004, I think was five. Uh, um, I had um, said, you know, to a friend that I was like, you know, unfortunately, I, I admit I've only read one black science fiction author and that's Sam Delaney. And I, I've read a couple Sam Delaney books, but um, I need to, to seek out more voices. And my friend um, sent me a copy of Parable of the Talents, which I read out of order <laughs> first. <laughs> um, but how did you guys discover the work of Octavia Butler and and obviously she's become very important to you guys because you've taken up a mission of, of spreading the word about her. So starting with John, um, mm -hmm. how did you um, discover Octavia Butler? Well, you know, I, I came to, to Butler's work relatively late. You know, I didn't, um, it's funny, like coming up in Mississippi, you know, I know this sounds weird, but, you know, because racism and like, you know, oppressive, racist spaces are so ubiquitous in that state. I mean, it's like normal, <laughs> you know, it's it's almost like you don't really realize, you know, to a certain degree because of the fact that it's like so systemically in place. So, you know, I was, when I went to Jackson State University, I didn't really come across like black speculative fiction writers at all. There are quite a few, if you think about speculation. 
Um, so we focused a lot on like the Harlem Renaissance writers and you know people from the Black Arts Movement and stuff like that. Um, I really didn't come across Butler's work until like maybe the early 2000s or so, like yourself, you know? Um, and I, the first thing I read was Wild Seed, which is still my favorite of hers. It's just such a wonderfully constructed narrative. It was, uh, I've just never read anything like it. And in fact, it was a black woman writing about these, um, these different types of like power hierarchies around gender and also like challenging ideas around like body and, you know, and, and body horror, but also like what, you know, identity in the body, you know, these types of different things. So I was, I was really blown away by it. And um, yeah, and that was the first time that I, and I started reading, I think Kindred was the next thing I read. And then I just kind of read some things out of order, you know, um, but yeah, that's, that's actually my first uh, introduction to her. And I, I remember like when I, um, when she passed away, I actually did a, a portrait of her for a faculty show, you know, and there was this dean whose wife came to the show, and she just loved the portrait, and she didn't know who Octavia Butler was. Even she contacted me, you know, because she was also and she started. I think she read Kindred first, and was like, "Oh my God, this woman was amazing." So I gave her the portrait, and she actually like um, redesigned her like sitting room or something around the color scheme of the of the, of the portrait. This is really oh, cool. Wow. Like she was just moved to tears by. Yeah, it was really a cool, it was really a cool exchange, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but so that was the first time I was introduced to her work and just been a huge fan since then, so. Mm. Damien, Damien, how about you? Sonny's Blues. Sonny's Blues was the James Baldwin story. I was trying to <laughs> You looked it so up. So 20 okay. minutes from now, I'll answer this question. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, so I came to Butler, I think it was like, it was either 1999, 2000, around then. Mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, when I was an undergrad and taking creative writing classes. I had written a story that was like a first person, written from a first person perspective. And uh, the professor told me to check out Kindred, I think because the same, uh, written from the same perspective. But I didn't know anything about the book. And um, I went and got out of the library and uh, it was one of the older editions where the cover is a bit more abstract and you don't really have a sense of what the story is about at all. Um, I, I think it's one of, it's like two women's faces and like a, a hourglass between them. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I sat down and read it um, and I, I tend to read kind of slow. Like I think when I'm reading, I'll start picking apart like, how did they put that sentence together and stuff? Um, which sucks for my overdue fees at the library. But uh he, uh, yeah, so when I was reading Kindred, uh, it's written in such a way where if you don't know what the book is about, you don't realize Dana, the main character, is Black until about 30 pages in. Um, and you realize she's Black at the same moment she realizes she's traveled back in time to a slave plantation. So it was like, especially at a time in my life when I was uh, really focused on trying to understand the craft of writing and trying to understand like uh, how like, subject and structure work together. It was really impactful for me to see such a brilliant moment where the, the stakes of the story become uh, clear both to the main character and to the reader like at the same time right. and um, in so impactful a way. So yeah, so after that, I, I read that book straight through. Uh, it was probably one of the few novels I've read in a single sitting. And um, so, yeah, so that was my introduction to it. And I think, I think I read Wild Seed next. Oh, it was Wild Seed Parable of the Sower. I think I started Parable of the Sower and it frightened me horribly and I put it down because <laughs> I could not get that far. Uh, and Wild, Wild Seed is more fantasy and, you know, set in the past. So like there's a bit more distance when reading it. So that one, I think I was the one I finished next. Hmm. Yeah, well, and it's interesting that you talk about the, uh, we'll have to come back to that reveal because you had to, you know, adapt that book um, eventually. But how did, how did these projects start? Uh, um, and either one of you guys jump in with like, with how this began, because one of, I, I'm assuming one of you had to be like the kernel of the seed of this, or were you brought together by the publisher did somebody else um, 
Right. Well, John and I have been working together for like 15, 16 years. Um, oh, okay. And we actually tried to get the book two different times, or we tried to get the job of adapting Kindred two different times. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, 2009, there was an open call from uh, Bean Press, who has the rights to the uh, prose novel, and they were going to do a black and white adaptation. Yep. And I found out about it kind of last minute. I just read uh, read about the open call in like a Publishers Weekly like newsletter or something. And um, I called the editor right away. And John and I had already been doing uh, comics work based around these issues of like uh, identity and race and like uh, representation and how representation works as a sort of labor and all these kinds of things. Uh, so I, I called the editor and I was like, you know, I think we'd be great for this. And she's like, okay, well, we just need a, like 16 pages of comics and a proposal and we just need it in a week. And uh, John was traveling at the time, as he always does. Um, well, he used to always do. And uh, um, he was giving s uh, several talks uh, across the country. And uh, yeah, so John, what'd you have to do? Well, basically I had to, um, after he painstakingly put together a, you know, a sample script, I would basically have to like draw images um and i think it was using like pen and ink and marker or something like that and damien was basically like taking what i sent to him um because what i would do is like whenever i hit a different city that i was speaking at because i think i had three different talks over a week um i would basically draw like a crazy person the whole time i was there and then like fedex you know images on paper back to damien so he could actually like scan them in at a kinko's and pull put them together so yeah that's what i did so i was like drawing pieces of stories and uh and then I, and, i'd have to like put them together in photoshop so john was in it'd be like a drawing of one figure like, and a house uh, over here yeah. a prop there and a background there and i was kind of like photoshop puzzling it together it was great um, yeah yeah no see, and, that's interesting because i didn't know that you guys had worked together and i also assumed just from like the way the, the about the authors is as I assume that Damien was the artist and John was the writer, but it seems like you guys share those duties a little bit more. Um, yeah, uh, depends on the project. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it kind of depends on the project, I think. Um, I mean, John does more uh, drawing and illustration stuff, and I usually do more uh, writing and lettering. Okay, but so it very, um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, um but yeah like it varies from project to project yeah um yeah so basically like we managed to get that crazy project in right under the wire the proposal right? yeah yeah for that particular version of it and uh we utterly failed in failed getting. horribly so, did not get the job yeah did not get it exactly um, <laughs> so, and it was like the hardest i remember i would like letter or put together one of these pages and I'd have to go in a dark room and like lay down with my eyes covered for a little while to get like the computer after image gone and like go back to it. Um, but yeah, so we didn't get it and we were totally not bitter at all. We were nope. a little, okay, we were a little bitter. We were a little right, bitter, but that's fine. It's okay. Um, that you know, we were like- forward, right? That it no. ended up, it didn't move forward. Uh, and we found this out like three years later, uh, 2012, we were at the, San Diego Comic-Con. Yes. Uh, I was on the plane headed there. John got there earlier and he was shopping around uh, some other comics work uh, yeah, we've right. been doing and he'd been doing to different publishers. Right. And then uh, how'd that go, John? Yeah, we were, we were there. It's weird because I think we were there because of a black film festival panel, you know, because cause we were talking about black comics. And we actually met Maury Turner, which was awesome. Right, it was Maury Turner, right? Yeah, it was Maury Turner. Yeah, uh, and so anyway, we did but, uh, pals. and Robin Givens was uh, the host of the panel. Very For nice lady. But, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but, but um, I thought she was nice. Yeah, she was uh, super so, nice. It was just weird. It was weird. So anyway. Like, she didn't seem to know why she was there. I know, either. right? She was just like, oh my God, you know, I just got mobbed by fans walking across the floor. You know, it's like, I just saw a bunch of Batman. It was hilarious. <laughs> so. Comic-Con. Anyway, so I'm showing images to people and roll up on 
uh, Sheila Keenan, who at the time was still working with Abrams, she was a senior editor for them, really, really talented uh, editor and writer in her own right, actually. Um, and uh, yes, I'm showing sure her work and she's like, you know what? I think that your work will be perfect for this project I'm trying to get. Are you familiar with Octavia Butler? And I'm like, why, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, what book are you trying to do? And she's like, Kindred. And I'm like, Kindred? Kindred? Like, for, wait, Kindred? <laughs> you know, because then, then it dawns on me that, yeah, that book never happened. And uh, yeah, and she's like, okay, well, you know, I'd love to work. And and I was thinking like, man, this would be a great project for me and Damien to do. And Damien gets there and I'm like, yo, I just met this wonderful person, you know, Sheila, who's at Abrams, who thinks that maybe we could do Kindred. And then Damien was like, I was like, Kindred, Kindred? Like, like Kindred? <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. Kindred Lamar. He's, he wasn't a thing yet. Um, but <laughs> so it's like, but no, what was really funny is that, you know, we were still, we would bump into her like for the rest of the of the time there. It was almost this weird, like, you know, law of, what was it, rules of attraction kind of thing where we would just bump into Sheila like in different panels. We saw her across. Yeah, she know, was like, school. she was getting off a panel in the same room we were about to go on. Yeah, so stuff like that. It was just kind of interesting. And then five months later, uh, once they worked out the uh, the details, we had to, we actually had to send in some tests, some uh, you know, some image work or whatever. And you know, but that I was, think we sent in um, some samples from like our first graphic novel, The Hole. Yeah, and maybe some of that graffiti monster killer stuff. Yeah, there was some graffiti graffiti monster killer stuff and a few other things. But um, yeah, and then five months later, we were signed a contract to do Kindred. It's crazy. So there's other there's there's other drama, you know, but I don't, we won't probably go into that, but you know, yeah, that was, uh, that was how it happened. Yeah, yeah. It was a strange, like, uh, you know, cause it was a thing we had sort of given up on and then it came back around to us. Yeah. Like so, it's almost like, yeah, we were destined to work on it, but just not when we thought. Yeah. You know you know? It had a, a weird, it shows us vibe to it. Um, it was very was strange. Like it. Yeah. yeah. And so do you have uh, one editor that's been working with you through all these Octavia Butler projects or, or a publisher who's no, the opposite? <laughs> yeah, we've, it's this, been the same publisher. Uh, Abrams Comic Arts has been, we've been working with them through all the Octavia Butler projects. Um, but so it, it ended up that Sheila, who brought us on, left the company right when after we signed the contracts. Yep. Uh, we had a different editor for a while uh, who was actually the cartoonist who had gotten the original Kindred job in 2009. Yes. Like she had gotten the job that we didn't get. And then she ended up being our editor for a while. Um, and she she also, I think, didn't even know the Kindred thing was happening till she got to work there. I don't That was weird too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. And then... Uh, but then she ended up leaving the company um, a little around a year later, and they hired Sheila back freelance to edit Kindred. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, with Parable of the Sower, we've been working with a different editor, Charlotte Greenbaum, yeah. who uh, she was hired pretty soon. Uh, I guess it was right around the time we were starting work on Parable. That's correct. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems about right. Yeah, because... Uh... Cause it took a while because we we actually uh it's a two book deal we're doing parable of talents as well mm -hmm. um it was already put in like the first draft of a script you know um yeah so we're just figuring out when that next book is going to happen but yeah we we basically they basically presented us after kindred was so successful they were like well what else would you want to do you know mm -hmm. and um i think with the uh ushering in of the new this particular administration we felt like that p the parable duology would be the best thing to do <laughs> right now and so it felt like we were entering into that world or uh getting closer to that world yeah yeah at the time this might be a, a kind of a weird explanation but i wanted to talk about for a second about something that i saw in the last couple of days about the power of parable of the sower um, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, um, it sings for a hardcore band that's one of the most radical hardcore bands out there, this band Race Trader, which is, um, you know, about radical politics and, 
and whatever. Mm-hmm. And the singer for this band, Money, he uh, he posted yesterday or two days ago on Facebook, like, hey, what are some good dystopias that I should read? And the amount of right. people who responded with Parable of the Sower, I just want to say that I, res- I said that first, but <laughs> <laughs> responded Parable of the Sower, and there were so many people that responded Parable of the Sower, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the one he reads first because right. I, I, I counted at one point and um, 15 different people without having looked at the other replies said uh, some form of Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, Octavia Butler. Yeah. Right. And, right. yeah, and these are all people that come from radical circles, I think, um, which is interesting. But, um, and the reason why I asked the question um, about editors is because, and, and, and now I'm seeing that it's probably you guys that have this continuity. Um, I love the choices of the two authors that you've got for introductions, for example. Mm. It seems really, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Nalo and, and Nettie seem like perfect choices. To, to introduce Octavia. Can you give me some, some background on, on uh, choosing the introductions? And maybe, and you don't have to give away who's going to be the parable of the talents, but I wouldn't mind knowing. Well, we won't, we don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> <that's probably it. laughs> um, oh, yeah, so, I mean, we've been friends with Nettie for, uh, she taught our book, actually, the whole, at, when she was at uh, Chicago. She used to teach at Chicago State University. Mm-hmm. Um, directly influenced by Octavia Butler and had a relationship with her and really liked our work, you know, and like I said, we're friends and we used to work together, actually, um, we used to work at Buffalo, I mean, University of Buffalo together. And um, uh, actually, you know, we we just finished doing some work on an adaptation of one of her short stories into a graphic novel, actually, um, as well for my, for the new uh, graphic novel line that we're doing. Um, but yeah, so we just felt like, first of all, because Octavia Butler's work speaks so well to, you know, a black feminist or black womanist, you know, uh, space that Nettie and, and Nalo actually would both be great, um, you know, people for those introductions. And I think we were right about it. I mean, I, I love Nettie's, uh, you know, just kind of uh, the, the, the way that she talked about Octavia, I thought was, was, was wonderful. And then Actually, you know, I teach at University of California, Riverside. Nalo Hopkinson teaches here. You know, she actually helped recruit me here to teach. Um, and we've become really good friends since then. And she was actually really close to Octavia Butler as well. I mean, we had, there's so many photos, photos of them together. And, um, you know, we just thought that she would be a great follow-up. You know, I mean, I think that they're still two of the top you know, science fiction and fantasy writers who just happen to be women of color. So, in fact, um, for Parable of the, of the Sower, uh, we had Tanana Du, who teaches Parable of the Sower like every uh, year at UCLA, help us with some, she was kind of like a sensitivity editor, so to speak, you know, for like Parable of the Sower. So, yeah, yeah but those, are, those I, are some, I mean, you want to add to that, but those were some of the things we thought about, you know. Oh, it's just um, adding to, uh, you know, having Tanana Reeve work with us like I was when we first started working on the project uh, on the parable of the sower I felt like I wasn't as familiar with that novel as I was with kindred Mm -hmm. like kindred I had read multiple times prior to you know uh, working on it as an adaptation parable of the sower I'd only just read it you know as a reader a couple times Um, so uh, definitely we talked about wanting to have someone who had a greater depth of knowledge or who had been working with the text for a long time to make sure we were doing it justice right. um and especially like so much of parables is about uh earth seed the uh theology created or discovered by the main character i mean people take that belief system very seriously uh so we wanted to make sure we were respecting the investment of octavia butler's fans um as much as we did with kindred if not more right yeah, I'll, we'll come back to that, to, to how you adapted Earthseed, but, um, and yeah, and I loved both choices for introductions. I'm a huge 
Nitty, a Cora Four fan. Um, I, Binti, I, she's one of my dream guests eventually um, because mm -hmm. I want to talk to her about the Binti trilogy, which I absolutely is is a favorite of mine in the last couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Lagoon, I just loved as well. So, um, Lagoon, yeah. Wait, I, I, I'm actually not to be all braggy, but I was, I think I probably was like the one of the first handful of people to read the beginning of Lagoon. She wrote that when we were before she started teaching at the University of Buffalo, and she was like, "Read this. What do you think?" And I was, and I was like, "Huh, <laughs> this is really good." And yeah, and so cool yeah, brag. It, it, no, it I, I I take that. No, it was kind of cool because yeah, we you know we do talk a lot about like just story stuff and um, a lot of other things too. So mm -hmm. not to be all braggy, but I think I was one of the first people John told that he read the first part of. You know what? I I believe that you were <laughs> right. Actually, you were right. You're right about <laughs> that. Was about the same time that you know, I I had I, I asked her about re, uh, adapting the book that we just uh, worked on actually because it's based on a short story. Hers called On the Road. It's from uh, the um, Kabu Kabu collection. So mm -hmm. oh yeah, you guys were working on that for a long time. This is yeah different ver variations of it. You know, we just couldn't figure out the hell we want to do with it. So and then well, yeah, I'm wondering <laughs> because. Uh, um, you, they did the introductions if um, you had kind of, you know, kind of off the record conversations with them about the project and if they helped you guys kind of think about the project in a different way as being the introduction, you know, authors, or did you not really talk to them until you'd already finished it? No, no. I mean, uh, I think, especially on Kindred, I think, you know, not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Danny, but, you know, we were, I mean, I was, <laughs> you know, um, it's a really daunting task, you know, to actually, like, take, you know, an author who is, has such stature and, like, such a brilliant writer and who has so many fans of her work and actually try to, like, distill it into something that was graphic. So I actually was sharing stuff with both of them on Kindred in particular quite a bit, you know, just to get their takes on what they thought early on, you know, because the fact that they both knew her so well and were both huge fans and very much in some ways, like, you know, her heirs, you know, her, them and like Ned, you know, N.K. Jemison, people like Nisi Shaw, you know, were, you know, influenced by her so much, so. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I know John was sharing the in-process work with them because I, you know, I would ask like, is it okay? Right. Are we doing okay? Like, I, I was definitely terrified the entire time of writing yeah. the scripts um, of somehow, you know, not properly respecting Octavia Butler's legacy. Exactly. Um, and and I do remember specifically have I ha I remember one conversation I had with Nettie. She was in Champagne uh, for uh, it was like Black Geek Week or Black something. Geek like that. Week. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And it wasn't like, like she didn't, it was really early on. I was just saying a couple ideas and she was just like, you know, encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I remember talking to Nalo at one of the Black Comics Art Festivals in San Francisco. Uh, and by then she had seen some of the in-process stuff. And I just remember she was also super uh, encouraging and, you know, said she thought we were, we were on the right track. Uh, yeah, it, it was funny because, uh, you know, we, we, we've been really fortunate that we, you know, friends with or have connections with a um, collection of people of color who happen to write speculative fiction, like Daniel Jose Older, for instance. I was at um, I was at the uh, Decatur Book Festival, and this is when we and I was working on thumb. I was actually doing thumbnails, you know, for the book by this time. So we were, I was deep in the process, and you know, he saw me like drawing stuff off in the corner. He's like, "Oh my God, what are you doing?" I was like, "Well, I'm actually, I'm actually drawing." you know thumbnails for like kindred and he's like what <laughs> you know so that was pretty cool you know i actually met delaney at that festival too because i had just done a um i did the cover design for uh bill campbell's book uh stories from chip mm -hmm. it was chip no stories for chip yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah from rosarium so i did the, the book cover design for that so it was pretty cool so just to meet him face to face right and now that i'm thinking of it i now know your style because I recognize your work on a couple things because I'm relating mm -hmm. it to that one. So I do a lot of book I have yeah. enjoyed several of your covers. So uh <laughs> um 
Sorry, I'm trying to manage. Uh, this is a loud time for the dogs um, of the That's day in my, my home. So I will be muting when you guys are talking. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm surprised my kids haven't been yelling. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I just heard my wife and kid just come back in from like his floating, floating slash swimming lesson. So <laughs> I was like. All right. Well, we'll we'll try to manage this. This is uh, doing interviews during the pandemic, right? Um, yeah. Yep. And uh, so, do you consider Kindred science fiction or horror, or do you think the distinction matters at all? Uh, yes. That's it. No. Um. Yeah. So I mean, I consider. Uh. Well, Butler considered it. Uh, fantasy, a grim fantasy, is what you call Kindred. Like yeah. because there's no science involved in the time travel aspects um and really the rest of it is just kind of a alternate history almost historical fiction um so i kind of go along with that but i think uh, john and i especially identified it with horror um not only because like it's a it's clearly horrific um but because it's very much uh written as sort of a gothic yeah uh like a ghost story right. uh, or like a gothic romance mm -hmm. um but you know uh strained through this filter of uh history of child slavery and white supremacy that really i, I don't know how else to describe it but horror um yeah, yeah, yeah. i guess the other way to describe it would be american history but <laughs> i think i think that's why we we really leaned heavily into the horror aspect of it yes um and tried to make the images function in that way which uh worked out more i think well above our expectations because we got a bram stoker award yeah for yeah, that's crazy. yeah um yeah i was the first yeah. african-american man to get a Graham Stoker Award because Linda Addison had one for many. She's had she does. She's got a bunch, right? Bunch, she has a bunch, yeah. But you know, yeah. But it was wild, yeah. So I, yeah, I'm echoing. I'm gonna echo what Damien is saying because I always use Kindred as an example. When we talk about Afrofuturism and like Black speculative fiction. That you know, it gets couched under these uh, these terms like Afrofuturism. But I was like, well, do you ignore tropes like you know? the gothic tropes that are so evident in kindred you know and even came with this term called the ethnogothic where it's like about using got the gothic and like you know looking at race critically and kind of combining those things to kind of get to a better future so to speak so it's, so it's speaking about like dealing with those specters that damien is talking about um yeah i mean i think it uh i think it definitely comes across as more of a a dark fantasy or like a horror novel um just from just the types of the type of symbolism she's using and yeah yeah yeah. so and it does matter you know i think it does matter actually uh as far as like the the different genre designations you know so well one of the main differences in my experience and reading your version of kindred and reading the parable adaptation is that um, to my shame as a sci-fi bibliophile, I haven't read Kindred yet. Um, mm. I read yours first, um, and it's a hole in my Octavia Butler reading. Um, so I read it a little differently, but um, one of the things I said in my review on, um, when I reviewed your graphic novel was that I said, you know, basically that for me, one of the interesting things was that the time travel aspect of the story and is like really not important. It doesn't matter. It's the mountain sized moral dilemmas at the heart of the story that to me really drove the narrative even more than, you know, it's like I always say Man in the High Castle isn't about like, gee, scary Nazis are here. It's about how history is unreliable, right? That's is what it's about and for me i've seen that kindred is less about just the horrors of slavery but that specific moral dilemma the moral dilemmas that come up for the characters and specifically i was thinking about the whole situation if they kill the slaver it could break up the family and that becomes like one of the driving parts of the narrative am i wrong is that yeah. something because i thought that was the main thing that i got from reading it Definitely. Um, yeah, 
Well, we took we kind of took um Butler has this quote that I will paraphrase horribly now. Um, but uh this idea that she wanted to make a book where you like could feel history and like empathize with history and like think of history as something lived through by real people. Mm -hmm. Um so like what you're talking about with the the moral dilemmas and the fact that there's really no good answer and that um there's really no happy ending, right? Like that it's just not a po like a possibility right um yeah so i think i think that was a big part of what we wanted to bring to the adaptation um because it is definitely there in the original work and then also she wrote she one of the reasons she was inspired to write it was uh she was in college and she heard um kind of a, a kind of radical leftist uh student like a, a black student saying that something to the to the effect of we could have the revolution if we just got rid of all these old people. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'd have to start with my parents or something like that. And um, it, it was like a reaction to that thing of where people are like, oh, if I was back in slavery, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked cotton. I would have punched the overseer in the face. And, you know, like that sort of reaction we have to history or, you know, even now, like talking about man in the high castle or people like, oh, I would never have gone along with, with the Nazis. Um, and here we are, but uh, right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that that's from that right first second, but <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so like those aspects of the story, I think, were really, really important to her in writing it, and so we took those on as well as important to uh, maintain and uh, emphasize in the graphic novel. Well, and I thought it was important because, um, and I first read it because on a like impulse of I was at the library and I saw it on the, the new releases rack and was like, oh, damn. Like, like, I love Octavia Butler and they did a graphic novel of this. And I hadn't read it yet, but I was like, you know, it's really cool. And because I review everything that I read, I was like, I want to support this project. I knew that mm -hmm. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, so how has been the, how has the reaction been to Kindred? Because I feel like it's such an important story to, to 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 put a fun fun by like a genre aspect. I mean, it's a you know it's not a fun story, but right. you know how has it been to be able to? I'm sure it's brought it to a new audience, um, kindred to a new audience and new eyes, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the reaction has seemed to be mostly positive. I mean, which we were totally terrified about. So um, it's been adapted into, I think what now is it's about to be adapted to like another la six languages, Damien, is that right? That means, I, it's possible, I, yeah. I, 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 I lose track until I see the actual. It, right. I've received like two like, translated volumes, I think. So, right. Yeah. And it's like, it's also like, it's gonna be a bit Swedish and, and uh, um, Korean fairly recently. Yeah. And, yeah so it's like, so people seem to be um, engaging with it um, and mostly, I mean, I guess as much as you can enjoy that story, <laughs> you know, enjoying it. And, you know, it's it's been rated pretty well. And uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's people have been overwhelmingly uh, positive, mostly. You know, we've had some folk who I'm sure there's plenty of people that don't like it, but, you know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, overall, it seems like it was, that we did a good job. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, there, you know, we were concerned about. Uh, we always make this joke where, like, Octavia Butler fans are like Beyonce's beehive online, but they all have PhDs. Like, they're fiercely um, <laughs> protective, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we were, I think, expecting much more um, criticism. Uh, then we got, um, I mean, I, it, like, I'm sure there are negative reviews, but I try not to read them if there yeah, are. Yeah, well, right. I mean, yeah, but no, um, people. Like, like, N.K. Jemison liked it, so I was like, I think we're okay. Yeah. And then um, uh, when we met uh, Octavia's cousin, uh, and she, she said it was, she gave us, just, like, the highest praise. Like, that was, I think, the first time I really kind of breathed a sigh of relief. 
Yeah, well, that and also the the fact that you know when we first started doing it, we had to actually do we had to finish like what, about fourteen or so pages of it, or something like that, mm -hmm. to send to the uh, estate and the family and stuff. So they had to sign off on it before we even worked on it. And then the other thing that was really interesting is that you know when we did get it done, I've never worked on any project where there were like no changes. You know, uh, so that was pretty amazing to me so yeah <laughs> yeah the estate they had like their only note was um they wondered if dana's hair should be like a bigger afro because it's in the her present day is the 70s right um, but we actually had a rationale for that because we wanted to show her hair grow while she's stuck in the past it great it was a great way to show t the passage of time so yeah yeah but beyond that they were they just gave it the go ahead and uh the same with Parable of the Sower, I don't think they really had any notes. That's no, I mean, Yeah, your script for Parable of the Sower was so tight to start with, though. You know, it really was. I mean, it's like, I know I say that as many times as I can. It's like, I felt like when I read your script, I was reading, for real, like reading a book, but as a comic, <laughs> which is how it should be, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, but no, it was, uh, I mean, the publisher has been very supportive of, of, of the books and, uh, no, it seems like it was, it's been good. So, very grateful. I mean, we work very hard on on, the, on those books. So, yeah. Well, no, and the the packaging is amazing. Um, oh yeah, their their slogan is it's like Abrams, the art of books. That's what their <laughs> that's their slogan. They're they're the first art book company, art book publisher in the country, actually. Mm. I did not yeah. realize that. Really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the first, the first art book publisher. Uh, they started like 1948, something like that. And um, you know, uh, Harry and Abrams, he had like, I forget how much money. He, he I guess he had, he, had, he, had a, he had a small amount of money. He started up. But yeah, but they started working on like um, gallery books, like um, you know, books about Cezanne and Picasso and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then they segued into um, into popular culture they had a book about disney that was kind of like their big book to kind of segue into popular culture and before you know it i think i have that book yeah i mean everybody yeah. I, I had a copy of that book you know another book that's actually a book that a lot of black people have it's called um i think it's called long remembered or oh shoot i forgot the name of the book but this it's this it's this image it's a photography book with this beautiful elderly black woman on the cover and she has her hand up like this you know oh, and it. i saw I saw it on somebody's shelf, you know, like how people have been doing like the uh, the talks on CNN mm -hmm. um, and they'll show their bookcases and stuff like that. And I was telling our, our executive editor, editor Charlie uh, Cochran, that that book is in a lot of black folks' homes, you know? Yeah. Uh, I was like, and lo and behold, I was like, yep, there it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a big seller. It's, a, it's this beautiful black uh, art book that they do. But yeah, but they, they started and they kind of segued into comics uh, about a decade ago and that's and here we are so oh yeah it's very it's it just looks incredible so adapting sower um it has different weight to it because kindred has the whole history and getting like the period and all that correct but i think sower yeah. you know just like how we were talking about how many people recommended it um with the talk dystopia it is i I would assume that Parable of the Sower is her most popular work. So that adds a certain amount of weight. But also um, the just the intensity with which people take Earthseed seriously also adds to it. So mm -hmm. I, I would imagine like, you know, when you approach adapting it, that it is probably more daunting than Kindred, maybe? I don't know. What do you guys think? A little more daunting in some ways. Uh, by the way, I think Kindred is actually still her. I mean, I think it's so. I think it's like her biggest selling book. But uh, I don't know if it's more popular. But yeah, maybe Kindred. Her. Kindred, I know, is historically her best seller. Yeah. But Parable of the Sower is um, her first book on the New York Times bestseller list, yep. which just happened like two weeks ago right, or so something. It just got re-released by I forgot who, but um, right is that what happened? Because I know there was a new. There was a new. Yeah. Uh, there was a new edition, but also like um, apparently right now is the time to read Parable of the Sower because like that's yeah. that's yeah. what's been on everybody's list. But it, it's also kind of ridiculous that 
it, we're a couple of years away from when Parable of the Sower starts. And that was the first time Octavia Butler was on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, um, it's kind of crazy. But no, I mean, it, it was definitely more daunting in the fact that it had like about, what, three times more characters? <laughs> Something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a grander, it was a grander book. And, uh, you know, in some ways, like, Kindred works so well because of the mechanics of it being so intimate, you know, because a lot of the people in the story are actually like related, <laughs> you know, um, it almost feels like a play to me, like, like Kindred almost has like the, the feel of a stage play to me, you know, because you have very few sets and, you know, a small tight cast, you know, but Parable of Soar is like, it's a, it's a road trip. It's like, you know, you know it's, well, it's, it's like, it starts out where it's like a, it's a fortress defense kind of yeah. movie that turns into the road trip movie. There's a road trip movie, exactly. And then, <laughs> like the last hundred pages, she introduces like five new characters. I remember <laughs> just like losing my mind when I got, like I knew it was coming and I was still like, how could you introduce all the, like right now? Right now, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah it's pretty wild. But yeah, it was definitely, it, it was just daunting in different ways. Like uh, I found the writing of the script of Sower uh, the technical aspect was easier because, you know, I'd already approached a an, uh, Butler adaptation once before, and I knew what the audience and the editors and everyone, like, expected more. I had a better sense of it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the whole prescience of the story and, like, to be writing a scene about, for example, the wild, wild, flat, wild fires in California, um, and then for that to be on the news or to be writing a scene about, uh, you know, a prince, a uh, president infringing on civil liberties. And then that's like on social media. Yeah. Um, so that that was like a, a, a different kind of emotional trauma. It was, a, lot, it was, it was definitely an added level of tension that we that's very different. Yeah, I um, you know, we I, I live in Southern California now, obviously. And, uh, you know a lot of the color palettes and stuff were just taken from photos I was taking when we were driving around. The other thing is that, you know, um, our son Jackson was, you know, uh, was waiting to be born while we're waiting on, <laughs> you know, on the, uh, when we're working on the book. So, you know, the book took me about, I think eight, it took me about eight and a half months to draw and color, I think, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's about the gestation period. That's the same, you know, so, so he was cooking while I was booking, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, it just felt really strange to uh, um, to to be working on this really really dystopian prescient powerful book while this little black kid was waiting to be born you know into this this world that honestly was never meant for him to survive in honestly I mean if you think about it so it was you know it was, it was a very different type of uh, um, experience for me definitely. Yeah, and um, some of the technical aspects of how you uh, adapted it were um, pretty inventive and cool. Um, because speaking as you know, and it's funny too because I think um, one of the few negatives for me of of the experience of reading Parables and so on. There's not a lot because I think it's an incredible book, but mm -hmm. there are some. Um, things about it being a narrative being told as, as journal entries that you kind of know what that the person lived to tell the tale for example so I think you guys got freed up a little bit in telling the story that way which was cool but you put in the journal entries in a very cool way by having them handwritten and like it looks like little pastes from from the notebook and I thought that was really clever adaptation and also you're working in the earth seed philosophy so i wonder yeah. if you could talk to me about like how much you guys talked and thought about how you were going to do those two aspects of the adaptation um so i did a lot of, of a lot of the the lettering uh so I, I do the lettering for it so i, I did i came up with the the uh, journal entry text boxes um, which was actually, it's a, I made a vector file out of a picture of a notebook page. Um, and, oh wait, no, I tried that and it didn't work. And then I just made my own with vector graphics. <laughs> anyway, um, so I did a lot of like resizing of these notebook pages and like, should this one have a, like the hole on the side or not? And minute things that 
I assume no one notices, but um, <laughs> oh, it's good to hear. Uh, yeah, so I did. I did that because I definitely wanted. It, it is an epistolary novel, yeah. Um, and I definitely didn't. I wanted to uh, reference that and sort of pay tribute to that. Um, but doing that in a graphic way is actually, I mean, it's a, kind of like you're saying a bit easier mm. because it takes away the time constraints right. of prose. Um, so uh, yeah, I just thought that was important since it is told not only through Lauren's perspective, but her perspective as a writer who's using her writing to actively uh, attack problems and understand them. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, because um, with Kindred, uh, and this was our editor, Sheila Keenan's idea, we got rid of most of the prologue of Kindred. Uh, there, it's a much longer scene in the original novel. Um, and it's just one page in the graphic novel because our space constraints mainly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when it came to Parable of the Sower, I was thinking of uh, cutting, there's the prologue of the novel is a dream sequence, right? It's a recurring dream that Lauren has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And originally I was like, well, maybe we should cut that. Maybe we don't need it. But I realized that the character is supposed to be like a visionary because she's sort of this prophet character. Right. So keeping the dream seemed important. And then it came to how do we illustrate those dreams or like make it clear uh, that it's visibly a dream. Yeah. And um, sorry, my daughter's creeping in. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> you just getting a book? All right, she's getting her copy of Jerry Craft's Class Act, the sequel to New Kid. Oh, yeah. Highly recommended. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I do. I do need to get it. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, but uh, yeah, so a way to show the dream sequence is like immediately, visibly. And so I thought it'd be cool to integrate the notebook paper aspect to it. So I, that was one of the suggestions I had in the script for yeah. John was to incorporate that in the visuals as well. Yeah, there was a lot of like thing. We we had a lot more. We did a lot more comic booky things. And uh, you know, one thing that we always have been into is like um, doing uh, things, affordances that comics have that that they do better than other media. You know, and so you know, we were, so we had a lot more leeway to do more exper experimental panel work and things like that too. And one of my favorite things is the fact that we came with the idea to. Um, think about different types of mapping systems for the, the chapter open, openers because she is on a journey. She is searching for herself and searching for meaning. So, you know, using the the metaphor of the maps as chapter breaks, I thought was a really cool piece for like when we have the, you know, the, the different date timestamps, you know, um, oh, that yeah. was a really cool touch, that. you know. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, wait, I made one of them too. I made, I made the, um, the, uh, roadmap the with like roadmap. the coffee scene on it. Yep. I was excited about that. You know, you know the other thing too. Here's here's something that was really cool too is that <laughs> the last one where I think the last image that I did for the book for Parable of Soar was the part where her father draws a just a chicken scratch map for what you know where the money is. It's hidden under where the lemon trees, right? Yeah, like where stuff's hidden in their yeah. Yard. And so. I remember talking to Damien, like, so I was because I was about to make it to like more of a schematic. He's like, no, 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 it's actually like a scribble, so it's really a bad drawing. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, so I actually get to the last drawing was like this really like raggedy drawing that somebody would just you know do for like showing directions on like a side, on like a, a napkin or something. It was so awesome. So that was the last drawing. <laughs> It was, it was a like double page. cathartic, right? Just be like, ah. Yeah, like, ah, exactly, yeah. And I think Damien put like a notebook page under it or something, and that was it. I, I had to, yeah, I had to put the, the thing on there, and I had to move. Like, there wasn't space for the tree, but since yeah. it was all scribbly anyway, it was easy to just kind of like scooch it over a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. So stuff like that, you know. Um, both of us, you know, are uh, artists and, and designers too. Like, Damien actually does a lot of logo work and, and you know, does illustration as well. And so it's like, if we need to make changes on either side of it, we, we have the ability to do that. I mean, I often state like, you know, if we, if we need to, we can actually take an idea, like take a book from like original concept all the way through the publication, you know, cause I'm also a book designer as well, so. Oh yeah, that, like Pretty. a ton of freedom to do that. Um, one other, yeah. you know, one thing, one of the greatest compliments I think you can give the parable books, both of them, 
parable, the sower and the talents, is even if you put them together, they're still shorter than the stand. And uh, what's, <laughs> what's interesting is, because I always compare the parable books to the stand because, you know, it's post-apocalyptic, road trip, mm. spirituality, yep. it has all those things. But what's so impressive is that it has all those elements, but it's not, you know, like I like the stand, but it's way overwritten and it's way longer than it needs to be. And, you mm -hmm. know, um, and I think the fact that there's a version that's 400 pages shorter than another version of it <laughs> is a sign of just, you know, but what, and even though like I do like the stand with everything that it has in it, what's so impressive to me about the parable books is how much is packed in to such a short amount of prose that there's yes. so much world building there's so much and did you guys feel any like did you have to like stop yourself from trying to expand ideas or because you guys kept it really close this is a very faithful adaptation from what yes, I, I mean yes. i read it 10 years ago yeah, no, it's, um, I, I actually, so when we first, when I first started the script for Kindred, my first draft was like terrible um, because I, I added stuff that wasn't in the original novel. Um, and it was like this framing sequence where uh, Dana, the protagonist, is talking directly to the reader. And I realized I did it to try to like allow myself to not cut any prose like oh she's just saying everything here but there's a drawing <laughs> um and i also i think uh towards the end of that draft i was going insane and i i was like i'm gonna make a book that makes you read the other book that'll show you world i don't know um but that's a terrible idea from a sales perspective <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah yeah with this one you know um there's so much in it it like it is very tightly uh, packed with with story ideas and plot in the prose and there was stuff I wished I could expand on or like um, include more especially towards the end there's a lot about the mechanics of debt slavery in the world mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we kind of had to uh, go briefly over uh, that's much more in depth in the book in the original novel um, so it was it was more trying to figure out where things could be cut or just sort of hinted at and gestured to, so you still get uh, some of the impacts and some of the world building. Yeah. But it, it wasn't able to be as detailed as I would have liked. One of the things I wanted to, to that I lament is the fact that because of, as Damien said, as a page restriction, um, when Dana, you know, makes her final jump home uh, and Rufus is holding onto her arm, you know, and she's wedged in the wall and she's kind of fused into the wall. That was supposed, we, we wanted that to be a splash page, you know, because the drawing for that is like 11 by 17. It's a big drawing, but it's only like one panel <laughs> on a page, you know, right. and uh, it's just for dramatic effect. I just thought it could have been a great, like, um, you know, a great piece. You know? Yeah, yeah. Kindred, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. And like, Oh, I was just going to say also in Sower, um, a lot of it was trying to find ways uh, where you could introduce characters and have them make a visual impact. Because um, like in the novel, some characters who become important later aren't really mentioned much in the early going. Yeah. Uh, so trying to figure out ways to like have those characters present visually uh, in those scenes in the comic that that was kind of a challenge like um so highlighting uh zara who becomes like a major character later but isn't really mentioned in the first half yeah. of the novel um so it's kind of like sneaking her into the foreground of scenes um one of the few things i did expand on the writing is i gave dialogue to like her little daughter um because later i didn't have space for her to she goes through this like long uh monologue mourning her daughter and talking about how her daughter was killed and there wasn't space for all that in the graphic novel. So I tried to sort of counterbalance taking that away by adding a little bit of dialogue and business for the daughter early on. So as a reader, you still get some some sense of, you know, the impact of that loss, right, but in, right. in a different way, in a way that fit better with the comics medium than uh, prose. 
All right. So my last question about parable, the parable books, and then we'll kind of wrap up with what you guys are working on now. But this is a question. Feel free to tell me to go to hell and not answer this. But sadly, we lost Octavia Butler while she was working on the third book of the parable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trilogy. Probably. Yeah. And so it seems to me that, well, we'll never get a third book of the parable trilogy. We could potentially, based on her notes and the, what she was doing, potentially get a third graphic novel that would kind of um, give us a feel for where she was thinking and where she was going. Um, have you guys thought about this? Is this something that you've talked to the estate about or um, should I just stop? <laughs> Go to hell. This interview is over. <laughs> uh, uh, we, um, uh, other people have mentioned that, like um, I've had a couple other people ask about that, just like fans or readers. And I, I don't want to, um, it, there isn't, from what I understand, there isn't really enough of a clear idea where she was going with that book to make the third book without mostly inventing right. things. Um, Cause from what I understand that she's, she started multiple drafts and each one is different. Um, and each one has like different characters and different things happen to the, the characters who are going off to this alien planet. Um, but also, I mean, it, the third novel, I think it takes place either hundreds or thousands of years after the second novel. Right. So there is kind of a natural end point um, at, per, at the end of Parable of the Talents. Right. Uh, but I, you know, I think if someone was to continue her work in that way, it would probably be better to have it be a, a younger writer, um, you know, maybe someone who, who uh, got like the Octavia Butler scholarship or was coming out of Clarion or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like that's a different sort of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I personally wouldn't feel comfortable filling that, that role. Yeah, my, my thing with that is that if she didn't feel that they were right to be published, you know, uh, if she wasn't comfortable with them, I don't think it's, it's our place to, to disrupt that, to, you know, to, to actually try to do that because I want to respect what her wishes, you know, what, what her wishes would have been. She wasn't satisfied with what she was writing. So why should we put out something that she was not happy with, you know? So. Oh yeah, I, I, totally, I totally get it. It's yeah. just as a fan, well, we to ask. Her, yeah, exactly. everybody yeah. wants to kind of imagine what yeah. that third book would be. And I think a lot of people think about it all the time and and i but I, de I definitely agree with you that if she didn't feel especially if there's multiple versions i didn't know that i thought there was you know no. well i guess there are there are multiple versions of a lot of her novels yeah like she could write a novel two or three times before she felt like it was good enough like there's a version of kindred that was part of the patternist series um that like tied into some of her other novels. But... Yeah, does yeah, Doro is actually in a version of Kindred that she wrote. And there's there's a yeah. version of Kindred where like Alice comes to the future. Yeah. Um, like comes from the eighteen hundreds to the seventies. Yeah. And um, there's a there's a future there's a, thank you. There's a uh, version of it where I think uh Dana is a little girl or like young way younger, you know, I think too. Yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. Um so, so like Butler was super hard on herself i think she would exactly. she would write and rewrite yeah well it's funny because doing the philip k deck podcast we find chapters or short stories that he had plugged into random books here and there like all the time and mm, sometimes yeah. without rhyme or reason and then you're like wait this character was in this one and uh, that's why i recognize that name and it just yeah i think um, it would be interesting to see. I'm sure the people who um, have her papers have have done extensive study of of what she was. Yeah. Uh, well, they're still they're still cataloging her personal papers because there's so much. Uh, she kept everything, I guess. Yeah. Um, oh, great. But yes, the Huntington Library. Well, I have yeah, to we, say that 
Octavia Butler was, I had just recently discovered her work when she passed away and it was one of the first authors to really like hurt <laughs> for me, you know, like, yes. God, that stinks. And, and yeah. you know, what's really interesting is John Ridley being her neighbor was half the reason why a lot of people found out, you know, who she was instantly because he didn't wrote such a loving tribute. Um, uh and because his popularity and whatever but um yeah so uh incredible work on these two books um i i'm super impressed i i i cannot wait for parable of the talents and we'll hopefully have you guys back when when that comes out um because i definitely want to help spread the word on that too um uh, because Annette, I'm really looking forward to because it's such a it's such a different book. Um, that's one of the cool mm-hmm. things about the the two books is <clears throat> thematically connected, but 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 very very different. And I got yeah. to read Par- like I said, I got to read Parable of the Sower as as a prequel. Um, <laughs> you know, for me. Yeah, you know? I wonder. Yeah, I, it makes me wonder what that would be like. Like if I could erase my knowledge and go back and see what. It- that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was really interesting too because I knew where it was going. So it was, it felt more like an origin story than just a story because I had yeah. talents first. And, and, um, yeah. And so it was neat because, like, I already, like, I had a strong sense of where Lauren was going. And so Lauren, I think, probably felt stronger of a character to me than maybe, I know she's the narrator, but like, I think she's telling the story of all the people around her so well mm-hmm. in Parable of the Sower. But I think I had more focus on her because I had read the, the same book. But, um, but again, mm-hmm. it was more than a decade ago. And, and so it was cool to relive. And like one of the things, and um, it was funny because I was having a conversation with my wife while I was reading it. And, you know, I was telling her what parts you guys I was like, yeah, they're nailing it. It's very, cause she's read Parable the Sower. And, and it was, yeah. it was funny because I, it was so clear to me and having the conversation with her, how clear everything was still in her head, having read it more than a decade ago and how yeah. much the book lives with you, you know? Yeah. 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 It's such a testament to, yeah. to her power. Yeah. So, um, Damien and John, we're going to wrap up, but I would like to hear more about the different projects that you guys are working on and let people know how they can follow your work. Um, sure. uh, I, I st- highly recommend everyone follow you guys on Twitter and, and, um, and follow your work. I'm definitely a, a fan now and will follow you to anything you. that you do. Yeah. Uh, I will appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Start um, with Damien. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, most of the work I've been doing recently is, uh, it was weird. I finished the first draft of Parable of Talents right before the first shelter in place orders started coming down. So it felt like I finished Parable of Talents and then went to go live in it. Um, <laughs> so it's, that's been strange. Uh, so I've mostly been doing some lettering, um, including uh, After the Rain, uh, which John wrote and is drawn by David Brame uh, and is for uh, Megascope, the line of graphic novels John is is cultivating with Abrams. Um, it's an adaptation of Nnedi Okorafor's On the Road uh, short story. So I lettered that. Uh, I've been lettering uh, Clockwork Perindera from Lee and Lowe books uh, with uh, art by Raul III and written by David Bolas. Uh, with color by Stacy Robinson, who John and I also work with quite a bit. Um, and then I've been lettering this Tulsa, Oklahoma comic called Across the Tracks. Uh, also, that's what John is uh, is filling in some coloring duties on right now. Um, that Stacy Robinson drew, written by uh, Alvern Ball. And then uh, I've mostly just been trying to put together new stories or reworking uh, stories that got pushed to the back burner by the Octavia Butler projects. So uh, I've written a, a proposal for a book called Night Boy that uh, John and Stacy and I are gonna be working on. 
um, working on a new proposal for graffiti monster killers, uh, which the early art was what John showed Sheila back in 2012. <laughs> yep to get kindred um and i'm also working on this uh thing called center of the universe uh with our friend ed show mm. it's this kind of comedy about an intergalactic convention center which is um, that concept is so hilarious <laughs> it is oh, gonna be God. weird I'm, I'm kind of excited um and oh, yeah i think that's all I have to... <laughs> yeah yeah um, and then john um, drop Drop your knowledge. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So as Damien said, um, because of the success of the Kindred book, um, we were able to. I was able to um, start this new line of graphic novels called Megascope, which the, the name comes from. Uh, it's a device that W. E. B. Du Bois created in this this science fiction story he wrote in 1909 called The Princess Steel, and it's a device that can see through time and space. You know, and it's it's in a short story. I thought it'd be a great name for a, a line of books. So. Yeah, so uh, After the Rain comes out in January. Uh, it's the first of, um, let's see, I think it's signed like 14 books. So we're working on some really cool stuff like um, there's an Afrofuturist sun solar punk version of the Count of Money Cristo that we're doing called The Count. Um, we're also doing a book about the Emmett Till murder uh, as well. Um, there's a uh, Afro-Caribbean sci-fi fantasy book called Hard Ears that we're doing. So some really cool stuff. And Sean Martinbro's doing a book with us. It's called The Heavy. Uh, so we're looking at those, we're just editing those now. Um, I just put out a new, uh, I, I kind of like did a lot of the character design and like production for this book called The Blues Man, uh, which is based off a series of novels by Stuart Jaffe. And it's drawn by Garrett Ganey. We just put that up on Peep Game Comics. And um, yeah, and we're doing, uh, finally putting out the trade paperback of um, Blue, excuse me, not Blue Hand Mojo, uh, Box of Bones with uh, Rosarium. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a horror uh, story. I mean, it's kind of like almost like Afro, Afrocentric, like Hellraiser, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, but it's coming out pretty soon. So um, yeah, I'm actually finishing up designs. Right now, honestly, I'm waiting on Stanford Carpenter to finish his doggone intro, which is actually coming along. So it should be sick, I know. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, so that's about it. I mean, um, and then trying to get this uh, Tulsa Race Massacre book done. Um, and there's a bunch of other, you know, tiny projects that I need to finish up. Like there's this eight page COVID comic that I'm finishing up for uh, Penn State University Press. So. Oh, yeah, that's, that's all very exciting stuff. I'm very excited to hear about your graphic novel line. Um, uh, we need more like really um intelligent and awesome um graphic novels out there because uh or that are deeply you know in the genre um and uh yeah. my wife just wrote me a note that you're both delightfully talented and charming fellows um <laughs> thank you. I always enjoy well, thank you. when i do interviews so um <laughs> we appreciate it. but uh, yeah, I have to, yeah. and i think um you know i'm a uh, I'm a big fan of, well, first of all, I've, I've been, especially through the work of um, uh, one of the biggest, uh, one of our favorite guests on the Dickheads podcast is Lisa Yazik, and she's been- Oh yeah, yeah Lisa's awesome. Yeah, and Lisa's been really, she made sure that I got the um, Afrofuturist um, journal that she was doing, and, and it was cool to see that, um, it, that Afrofuturism goes so far beyond like just the novels and the and the work that that we're having different spaces from from music and 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 graphic and yeah. the, the success I think of these Octavia Butler books, you know, because she was so groundbreaking in the field, um, you know, really I think it's important to pay tribute to her and to Delaney and all that. But you know, your new voices, um, your Nettie Corafors, your um, uh, I'm a big fan of Maurice Broaddus out of Indianapolis. Who's yeah, Maurice Broaddus is really, yeah, yeah. He's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, Peter, Peter Henderson's Jelly, right? Clark, I think. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. His just, new horror novel looks incredible. It's on my list. Yeah. 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 I just picked it up. Yeah. Really yeah. Really good. But then, you know, uh, Justina Ireland, of course, Tommy Adiyeme. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bunch of really great writers out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. And, but yeah, 
My computer's about to die, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're good. We're good. We're just finishing up. So I just really appreciate your time on uh, coming on uh, Postcards from a Dying World. We'll talk again, I'm sure, when Parable of Talents comes out. And um, I'll keep yeah. you guys in mind for panels that I do in the future because uh, I really enjoy talking with both of you. Oh, this would be great. Yeah, been I, great. I love it. Thank you for having us. Seriously, yeah. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. It, it's been It's been great talking. And thanks yeah. for the uh, review. Yes, thank that. you also for the review. That that was awesome. Oh, my pleasure, dude. You guys may, I mean, uh, paying tribute to Octavia Butler is pretty much uh, one of the greatest things that uh, graphic novelists can do. So, and we lost John. Oh, there, there went John's computer. <laughs> All right, Damien. <laughs> it was great having you. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you so much. Have All a right. good evening. Yeah, thank you.